My son Ben was a Hill Center student for, for three years here, and uh, he's a remarkable kid. Um, he has this generous open heart and uh, a wonderful non-judgmental sense which he gets from his mother, which I think you'll understand more about uh, as the story progresses. Uh, he also has a really warped sense of humor, which we love. He um, told us one year for Halloween he was gonna be a human test subject. Um, <laughs> He also loves playing with sort of old tropes. Like every morning when we go to the car to put the backpacks in the car, he pounds on the hood and he says, open the trunk, old man. <laughs> um, the people who, who get Ben, uh, they love these qualities about him. Um, and they're not frustrated like, like I am on occasion that every day for Ben is like that movie Fifty First Dates where he wakes up and it's like the past 13 years of instruction never happened. <laughs> Um, and in fact, every morning when Ben wakes up, he's, he's behind the eight ball, right? Like, it's no, there's no um, surprise that he likes video games like Minecraft, these immersive worlds where um, he's not judged by anybody. And the minute he sort of emerges from that fugue state, from the video game, um, he's failing to meet somebody's expectations and often they're mine. Um, and often, I think to myself, like, I think Ben's life would be so much easier, and I, I want it to be easier, you know, if he learned in more traditional ways, or if he uh, played sports, uh, which he doesn't really like, um, or if he read social cues more effectively, right? And when I think about that, um, I think to myself, like, wait a minute, Lee, like, Ben is really a lot like you were when you were that age. I mean, I was a nerdy kid, too. Um, I was a theater kid, and I did... Uh, uh, the, the quiz bowl, and I, I walked around in the woods with my friend Thomas when I was 14 and pretended to be my favorite comic book characters, right? Like, I wouldn't have known a social cue if it came up and bit me on the ass. <laughs> but I want those things for him, and we're now in this really awkward, mid-pubescent stage with Ben. I'm sure a lot of you with kids have, have seen that happen. Um, and it, it spells future pain for him and for me, for sure. The other night, he was trying to tell a joke to our beautiful, athletic, intelligent, college-age babysitter. And it was something <laughs> really stupid and painful about his noodles or something. And I'm in the back trying, like, desperately to keep him from embarrassing himself, like making the throat slash gesture and rolling my eyes. And, and Ben thinks that I'm having a seizure, right? And he's continuing to tell this joke, and he tells it five different times until he's recognized, right? And he and I are both thinking the same thing. And that thing is, how long is this gonna go on? <laughs> but of course, I'm thinking it about his social awkwardness, and he's thinking it about what a complete asshole I have become. <laughs> so there's that, right? <laughs> and I think back to moments in my life when I've been in that same position. When I was Ben's age, uh, I remember going to play practice. I was in eighth grade and there were all these high school kids there and I sit down and there's a drink sitting beside me and it has a cherry in it. And I decide to eat this cherry. Uh, so I did. And it turns out that the drink belonged to this uh, young woman named Shauna Dunderville. We're friends on Facebook now. <laughs> and she was a senior, she was beautiful, right? And she made this big production about someone eating her cherry. And so I decide, I decide the next day to bring her this jar of cherries and present it to her in front of the entire cast. And of course, they're losing their minds over this. The innuendo completely lost on me, of course. <laughs> and I think to myself, like, if my dad had been there to intercede, like if he had been able to intervene on my behalf in that moment and stop me from embarrassing myself, would I have wanted him to? I recently got an email from my dad, and, and attached to the email was this picture of him in college, and they're horsing around, he and his roommate, and they're um, sort of pretending to study while drinking and smoking, and I, I got from the picture that he was trying to prove to me that he used to be cool. <laughs> and so I, I fired off something back to him about like not wanting to shatter the parental mystique or something like that. And, and that really set him off for some reason. And he emailed back immediately and he said, you have no idea what I was like when I was 20. I was the king of campus. He said, I had friends of all different faiths and I knew lots of women and I studied hard during the week and 
played hard on the weekends in jazz clubs in New York City and Philadelphia. I was the president of the student body. And he went on to talk about student protests that he'd organized and various other things. And, and then he said something that I don't think I'll ever forget. He said, you have no idea what a shitty marriage and the pressure of parenting and a job will do to someone's personality. I wish you had known me in college. That's pretty heavy, right? And I think back to myself at that age, and I think about my dad, and I wonder, you know, do we, are we able to see ourselves in honest ways? Like, do we see ourselves really clearly? And if I could introduce my 20-year-old self to Ben, would he judge me then the way I'm judging him now? In 1992, a mere seven years after the cherry fiasco, <laughs> not many people know this, but I was named Greek Man of the Year at UNC. <laughs> I'm embarrassed to admit that that award was on my resume until about two weeks ago. <laughs> when I got to UNC, I didn't know anybody. Now, a lot of people would turn to social organizations like fraternities or sororities to solve this problem, but not me. I put all my social eggs in the basket of the UNC Student Union Film Board. <laughs> and it didn't take long to figure out that this UNC Student Union Film Board was not providing the social lubricant that I was looking for. <laughs> and about that time, I was invited to rush one of the fraternities. Um, and I didn't know what to do with it. I was sort of anti-Greek at the time, but I thought, well, you know, I'll give it a shot. I went to one of the parties and there were women everywhere. And I thought, these people have it all figured out. I'm not anti-Greek, I'm pro-Greek, actually. <laughs> one thing led to another and I got a bid from the house and I called my dad uh, to let him know. And this was, I was a KA, a Kappa Alpha. And uh, <laughs> we can uh, do the handshake after. Um, and uh, my dad didn't say a whole lot, um, but he said, you know, do you know the national reputation of that house? And I had to admit I didn't. And he said, they're racists. And I said, that can't be true. Dad, there are guys from Canada in the house. <laughs> so you can see that there's not a lot of like deep, deep research that went into the decision, but I... <laughs> I accepted the bid, and of course, pledging was a lot of fun, as fun as drinking someone's urine can be. Um, and I quickly developed the reputation of being sort of the cocky pledge. I disregarded what the brothers told me, and I wouldn't listen, and I fantasized about de-pledging in these really public and dramatic ways. But the allure of meeting women was really strong. And so I drank pee. But not every night. I mean, that would have been ridiculous. <laughs> and eventually, one thing led to another, and I, I became a brother. And I uh, had some fun and, you know, mission accomplished, met women. But over time, I began to realize that the idea of a fraternity was really dangerous, right? Like, who in their right mind would cede control over the lives of 18-year-olds to a bunch of 19-year-olds? <laughs> most of whom were drunk most of the time. Right? Like, this is not a sellable strategy. In addition to which, to make matters worse, our house was literally falling down around our heads. I remember walking up the stairs my senior year to my room on the third floor, and I hear this loud crash, and I, I go into my room to discover that about a thousand pounds of rain-soaked plaster had collapsed from the ceiling and crushed all of my belongings in my room. It would have killed me in an instant, right? Scary stuff. And all of this, you know, call this sort of the middle child syndrome, but I've, I've always had a very clear sense of right and wrong. And this began to feel really wrong to me. All of the, the alcohol abuse, the physical danger, the hazing, it all seemed very wrong. And so I decided to join the power structure, the Interfraternity Council, in order to effect some change, right? And so I ran for the president unopposed and somehow managed to win. <laughs> and, you know, it was a job that nobody wanted and expectations were zero. And about that time, a bunch of the, um, the alumni council folks, older men who were lawyers mostly, 
began to get tired of, of putting their own assets at risk for these teenage idiots who were in these houses. And so they leaned on the Interfraternity Council to develop a policy that would effectively ban kegs and common containers of alcohol from campus. And in me, they found like the sleeper agent, right? Like I was the Manchurian candidate waiting to be activated <laughs> within the IFC. And part of my um, Hearts and Minds campaign that I launched as I wanted to um, enact this policy was I got to talk to every single sorority chapter <laughs> across the entire campus. And I'm sure you could sense the delicious sort of twist of irony here that I finally got to meet literally thousands of women and yet I was telling them that I was taking away the beer. <laughs> but one thing led to another from pressure from the national organizations to the sororities, uh, we, we passed the policy. And you can imagine it was pretty unpopular. And my capitulation was um, not seen as uh, a positive by my own brothers, right? And they found really creative ways to express their displeasure one night as I cowered behind my door, two of my brothers who were coked up on something tried to break it down with an empty keg. I'm not sure if they like, sensed the symbolism of that act, but I'm also not sure what they were gonna do if they had actually broken down the door. Um, you know, at another time, all of my possessions in my room were stolen and redistributed to houses across the campus. Uh, I received threats from all parts of of the campus, and I eventually sort of wound up sleeping in the biology lab where I worked on, on campus. I looked over my shoulder for most of my senior year. It was kind of a scary time. I was 20 years old, and I was totally at sea. But my conviction to what I was doing and what I believed in never wavered. And then six months later, I graduated, and the policy and all its good intentions dried up and blew away. So what does this have to do with Ben? As parents, we want our children's lives to be pain-free. But what about when it shouldn't be pain-free, right? You know, I spent the better part of my senior year on the run from folks, and I wouldn't wish that on Ben for anything. But there's gonna come a time when he's gonna have to stand for something, when he's gonna have to call for change, when he's gonna have to plant a flag in the ground. And I want him to be ready. And of all the things that I am grateful for for the Hill Center, the thing that they gave Ben that I most appreciate and most value was that firm ground to stand on, where he could learn that sense of courage and that sense of self. Because one day, that courage is gonna meet up with that open heart and that non-judgment, and it's gonna create a pretty amazing human being. And at that point, he's gonna be able to tell his dad what it really means to be courageous. Thank you. That's Lee Hark. Yeah.